Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Telescope Man. Well, today, what prompted this video? <clears throat> you know, I'm always on various uh, tech nets that appear on the radio, and I listen a whole lot more than I talk. And I always find that uh, folks that are in the amateur radio hobby, you know, they're they're automatically a geek. And so they're highly interested in all the minutia of uh, the equipment. You know, the minutia of the equipment. And they will talk for hours, you know, about velocity factor uh, in a piece of coax. All right. In fact, they'll take up the whole net talking about the velocity factor in a piece of coax. So what I wanted to do today was to talk in a more practical sense about the hobby. And uh, maybe some of this will help y'all decide, some of y'all decide what equipment you want to buy, you know, how you want to put it together, et cetera, et cetera. Now, personally, I've got a very nice ham shack. Here, let me back away and give you a little view across the desk. All right, so as you can see, I've got very nice equipment. It all works properly. I uh, have never had any big problems uh, with the ham shack. Had a little uh, RF in the shack, radio frequency, that was tripping my computer when I first got started, but corrected that uh, by properly grounding everything. And that's another video uh, in a series of videos that I've produced was the grounding system. But <clears throat> let me scoot back again and put my glasses on and I'm going to start talking about coax. That seems to be a big discussion point with hams, uh, at least on some of the tech nets that I've been on, is they, they like to talk about coax. Uh, for an executive summary, there's really only two kinds of co coax that you really need to buy, okay? I'm going to say those first. For UHF and VHF, it's LMR 400. LMR 400. For HF, it's RG213. RG213. Now you could use LMR400 for HF, no problems. I'm going to talk about some of the advantages of doing that, but <clears throat> depending on your coax run, uh, you know, it might get a little expensive if you ran LMR400 or LMR600. 100 or 200 feet, you'd spend uh, quite a bit of money. So uh, what I'd like to cover today is the various kinds of coax and give you some numbers to go by. So let's start with LMR 400. Excellent for UHF, VHF, which means hitting a repeater. Having the, not losing any power, in those frequency ranges and being able to hit a repeater that might be a little bit far away uh, from you if you used another type of coax. All right, there's a reason for that. There's loss in coax. So let's go through the loss. For LMR 400 in a 100 feet run, that's what I'm talking about, a 100 foot run, these numbers are, that I'm going to give you are all for a 100-foot run. The loss is uh, 1.2 dB. Now, you really have to get up 4, 5, or 6 dB to notice the difference. Notice the difference, okay? I like to set that bar a little low and say... <clears throat> If there's 3 dB a loss, you probably need to correct something. Now, a lot of people are going to disagree with that and say, you can correct all you want, and nobody will ever hear the difference. But I'm just going to set 3 dB as a break point. 
if uh, if something is uh, loses you three dB or more, you probably need to move up to better coax. So anyway, LMR 400 is very low loss, 1.2 dB at, for a 100-foot run. That's very good. RG213 is 1.9 dB. All right, now here's where you know, all this discussion about velocity vectors and what's how much uh, is the braid shielded. And again, uh, I'm going to assume you buy good stuff and not stuff that maybe you get off of eBay that was made in China just to save uh, 20 cents a foot or something. You know, crazy. So let's go down the other ones. RG8, that's 8X or RG8 mini. 3.8 dB. Not too good for UHF, VHF. I'm going to go through some more numbers and tell you why it's not very good. RG58. Oh, the famous coax you would probably buy at Radio Shack. 4.6 dB a loss. All right, so running through those again, LMR 400 is 1.2. RG213 is 1.9. RG8 is 3.8, and RG58 is 4.6. So bear that in mind when you go out and buy a bunch of RG58. Yeah, it's going to work. You bet. It will work at 100 watts. There's no question about it, but you're going to lose some signal. By, by using it. Now, will it be noticeable? Yes. Or there's too many variables to tell you, but in the case of RG58 versus LMR400, you know, it's four times worse. Four times, almost. Four times worse uh, as far as loss goes. All right, let's look at what those pieces of wire will carry and let me uh, I'm going to talk about amps in a minute RG8 mini or RG8X or whatever 500 watts rated for 500 watts if it's a 100 foot run RG213 is rated for 975 watts all right, so I made this mistake when I first set up my shack. I, you know, put cheap coax in, and then I decided to get an amplifier, and guess what? I had to go replace all that coax because it wasn't rated for my amplifier. Uh, save yourself the hassle and do it to start with. Just set the shack up. Like you're going to go full-blown amplifier and everything, and you won't have a bit of problem on down the road. You can just add equipment as needed. Now, if we reduce the length of the coax to 50 feet, then the RG8 is rated at 800 watts. And the RG213 is rated at 1,500 watts. Look at this. LMR400, 2,400 watts. RG58, <laughs> even at 50 feet. All right. Uh, it's going to be less than 300 watts. 300 watts. Mm -hmm. Just say 300 watts. So really, you know, if you're going to stay at 100 watts and you're never going to upgrade and you're never going to run an amp and you really don't care that it has uh, 4.6 dB a loss uh, at, for 100 foot, uh, then go ahead and use RG58. It'll work, but it won't work as good as some of, the, some of these other ones. Uh, again, my recommendation is LMR 400 
for UHF, VHF, and RG213 for all the HF frequencies. The other reason I like uh, RG213 uh, <coughs> One, it carries high power, and two, the center insulation is a polyethylene type plastic. It's not the foam that you'll find in the LMR 400. So it's much less susceptible to melting when you put the end connectors on it. Uh, you know, it's a hard piece of plastic, so you really have to put the heat to it to, to wind up melting it. Whereas the LMR uh, 400, you got to be kind of careful when you solder it that you don't melt the insulation and cause a short between the center conductor and the braid. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see what else I can tell you. Again, you need the, the old traditional thought is you need about 6 dB of gain in order to tell the difference in the voice that you hear on the radio coming across the receiver. Uh, 3 dB of gain, some people say you can't tell the difference in 3 dB of gain, but I use that as a bright point. If it's 3 dB or more, then um, you know, you need to do something about it. All right, let's turn the page and see what else I can tell you. Remember those two numbers, LMR 400 and RG213. Another reason I like RG213 is it's real heavy duty. And if you're going to have it outside, like mine is going across the top of the roof part of the way. Now, we're in Texas, and it gets to be 110 degrees outside with the sun beating down on it. And the uh, plastic around the RG213, especially if you buy the military spec one, is UV resistant. So it's going to stay up there in good shape for a lot longer than say RG, a regular old RG58 is going to really deteriorate over a few years versus RG213. All right, the next thing is that I always hear them talk about is tuners. You know, I hear the complaints, you know, you shouldn't need to use a tuner, you, you know, if your antennas are resonant. Your antennas are resonant. I've done a lot of measurements on antennas and a lot of different antennas. They are re really resonant in not too wide a bandwidth, depending on how they're cut, where that dip is going to be in the resonance. When you get out toward the edges, uh, you know, it could be two to one or more out by the edges. Now most radios start cutting back power at about 1.5 SWR. Alright, they start pulling back on the power trying to protect themselves. So <clears throat> using 1.5 as a break point, I would say if you have an antenna that covers the entire bandwidth that you normally transmit at and you don't go out to the edges ever, then you don't need a tuner. However, if you're like me and you work digital down at the far end of the band and then you work a net up at the other end of the band, uh, even my beams uh, outside, which are highly resonant, are not that good at the edges. And they can take a little tweaking on the tuner. So my advice would be, yeah, you don't really need a tuner, but why not get one and tweak the antenna because you're going to want to go all over the place on all the bands that your antennas are quote, resonant for, and 
you're going to find portions of the bands that they're not that resonant on. So uh, think about getting yourself an antenna tuner. And again, when I bought mine, I did not have an amp, but I bought a legal limit tuner in anticipation of someday maybe having an amp. That way I didn't have to go out there and buy and sell whatever I bought at a loss and upgrade. Just put in a legal limit amp and go on down the road. You can get a MFJ 986 legal limit amp used for several hundred dollars. That's what I did. I couldn't afford an auto tuner for legal limit. They're $700, $800, $900. I couldn't afford that, so I bought a manual tuner that's uh, legal limit. Works just fine, has worked fine for four years now. So, advice on that one is, yeah, cut your antenna resonant. Measure it with an antenna tuner. You're going to find an antenna uh, analyzer. You're going to find that it's not quite resonant uh, out on the edges of the band or out toward the whatever edge it's not cut for. <clears throat> okay, the other one that uh, I'm going to talk about. Yes, I've read all the Part 97 rules, and I know you should transmit with the least amount of power uh, required to make the contact. All right. That's been said. All right. Now, when you transmit on 2 meter and 70 centimeter, 99% of the time, it's amateur radio operators transmitting into a repeater from wherever they are in their car, their house, walking around, whatever. Why not transmit full quieting into that repeater instead of trying to come in with two watts and have bacon frying in the background or dropping in and out Okay, you don't prove anything to anybody other than why don't you turn up your power so we can hear you fine because the repeater is going to take your signal and it's going to retransmit it for real at high power. So just because you can hit that repeater because you're four blocks away from the repeater with two watts doesn't mean that you should get in your car and drive around town uh, with 10 watts and think you're doing good because I guarantee you at 10 watts you're going to drop in and out somewhere as you're driving around. Just transmit the full power signal. Now if you're radio uh, if you're a big talker and it gets hot well yeah okay well let's cut it down to 25 watts. But I get a kick out of people that, uh, you know, come on and announce, <laughs> I'm using two watts to hit the repeater. Well, great. It's coming to me with 50 watts. It's coming over to me with 50 watts. So what does that prove? It doesn't prove anything to me, okay? Use enough power so you come in full quieting. That's the message. We want you to be full quieting into the repeater, and we want you to hold the repeater the entire time you're talking, not drop in and out. And that's probably enough said on the I'm transmitting low power. <clears throat> All right, what a uh, few more final uh, the little points I want to talk about. It's kind of a geek part of it, so. If you're new to ham radio, some of this uh, uh, may not register with you. But another question we hear all the time is, do you really need an amplifier? You know, I've heard it both ways. Amplifiers, it's just a waste of money. 
all you really have to do is have a really good antenna, you know, and you're going to be just fine. Yeah, that's true. You're going to have a really good antenna. I've got a beam up about 40 feet, okay? So I have a really good antenna. It's got a lot of gain and direction, too. And I can rotate it from inside of here. But, let me tell you, the only time you're going to have a great signal is when the great signal is when the propagation allows you to. So if you think you're going to put up a GRV5 or a piece of long wire and you're going to throw it over a tree and you're going to talk to the world, well, that's just not going to happen at 100 watts. Won't happen. All right? You're going to have to put some power into that wire, or into that GR. Uh, 5V or whatever whatever they call that particular antenna everybody thinks is really nice. Anyway, uh, yes, you do need an antenna because most of the time propagation is not that good. And do you need a thousand watt? No. You really only need five or six hundred watts. Because, again, the difference between 500 watts and 1,000 watts is less than 3 dB. So normally there won't be much difference, maybe one S unit, okay, between 5 and 1,000 watts, 500 or 1,000 watts. So you need to get that little extra punch that when conditions are not perfect, that you can be heard over the noise, and especially if you're working DX, so you can be heard over some of the other signals that are coming in. Yes, if you can put up a tower and a beam, uh, you're in, and an amplifier, you're in wonderful shape. You're in wonderful shape. Could you get away with an amplifier if you had a beam? up 40, 50, 60 feet, absolutely, you could probably get away uh, with just running 100 watts through the beam, and uh, you'd normally probably be heard. But the minute that propagation falls off a little bit, then that's when your signal drops down into the noise, even with that beam, and that's where that punch uh, with the, that the amplifier gives you will help you. So I always tell everybody, plan to someday have a, an amplifier. Plan someday have an amplifier. And set up your station so that you can use that amplifier when and if you get one in. Now in the meantime, uh, there's a beam antenna that I'm going to recommend to folks that don't have a tower. They don't have a tower. They have a backyard. Again, no HOA. Uh, they probably think you were putting up a clothesline or something, but uh, there's, a, there's a beam out there called a hex beam. It's very light, very light. It doesn't really need to be that high up. I have seen them mounted 10 foot off the ground on a little mast with a TV rotator on it, one of those ones you can buy for $100. And uh, it seems to work pretty well for better than the wire or the dipole is going to work. And... Uh, you can rotate it with a cheap rotator. So you could probably, let me just do some small estimates, and I'm going to assume you do the work yourself. We're going to buy a 20-foot piece of pipe. We're going to put that piece of pipe uh, four feet down. We're going to dig it with an auger. Four feet down, we're going to put that piece of pipe in there. We're going to fill that hole full of... Uh, uh, quick concrete, concrete, 
and let it dry. And then we're going to mount that uh, hex beam on the top of that piece of pole about 15 foot up off the ground. And uh, we're going to put a rotator up there first, a TV rotator that you're going to buy for $100. And then we're going to attach that hex beam to the TV rotator. And the hex beams can be built for about $400. There's kits that you can buy for about $400. And then, of course, you've got the cost of coax to get wherever you stuck that piece of pipe. You're going to have to get that coax back into the house. So let's just say for the cost of a... Low end new HF transceiver, similar, six, seven hundred dollars, you'll be able to have a beam. Now, <clears throat> you're going to have to replace that rotator every few years. You'll probably break it sooner or later. It's got plastic gears. But it should work fine for several years without any problems. If I was uh, trying to do it low tech, that's how I would do it. I would sink a piece of pipe in the ground, get myself a TV antenna rotor, put a hex beam on it, and uh, one of the smaller hex beams, and going down the road with a beam. And I would get out a whole lot better than somebody that was just using a wire or some kind of dipole up the normal height, which is about 20 to 30 feet. Most of us don't have big trees in the backyard. We're not going to be able to get that dipole 45 or 50 feet in the air. Not going to be able to do it. It's going to be somewhere between 20 and 30 feet. All right. And that hex will outperform that. Uh, low mounted dipole. So that would be my advice. Uh, check out this Google hex beam and uh, you'll see what that is. So with that said, I hope I, I, I might have gotten a lot of people mad with this video. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I get a kick out of all the discussion on coax. It's really not that difficult. Just go out there and get one of those two, the RG213, for your HF communications, and LMR400 for your UHF, uh, VHF communications antenna. And you'll be just fine. You won't have to replace anything. And... <clears throat> As far as a transceiver, uh, you know, I'm going to recommend one of two, and that, that would be low end ICOM 718, 600 bucks. I've seen them for four and five hundred used. Or if you want to step up a few hundred dollars, you know, probably something like a used. ICOM 7000 or a used ICOM 7200 and I have seen the 7100 ICOM uh, at 900 bucks that gives you D star at the same time so right now there's quite a few radios that you can buy either new or used that are very nice radios um, at a somewhat reasonable price. And uh, uh, normally hams feel like the $900 to $1,000 range is kind of a sweet spot for transceivers uh, if you don't have a lot of money. Anyway, with that said, I wish you clear skies. Don't beat up on me too bad. Keep looking up to see the greatest show on earth right over your head every single night. Y'all be good. See y'all later.